Hello, lovely people. Thank you for joining me for Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. This is my bedtime anytime story. And yes, I am squeezing it in at the last possible minute because I said I was starting today and it's uh, probably, I don't know, 10 minutes to until midnight, until tomorrow. So, but I was like, let me just get this in. Um, this is the type of behavior that I have when I am on a little vacation, you know, taking naps in the middle of the day and reading books at almost midnight. All right. So Victor Frankl was um, a prisoner in a Nazi um, concentration camp. And this is his true story. Thank you. When one imagines the vast amount of material which has been amassed as the result of many prisoners, observations, and experiences, three phases of the inmate's mental reactions to camp life become apparent. The period following his admission, the period when he is well entrenched in camp routine, and the period of following his release and liberation. The symptom that characterizes the first phase is shock. Under certain conditions, shock may even precede the prisoner's formal admission to the camp. I shall give an, as, a, as an example the circumstances of my own admission. 1,500 persons had been traveling by train for several days and nights. There were 80 people in each coach. All had to lie upon their own luggage. The few remnants of their personal positions they still had. The carriages were so full that only the, top car the, only the top parts of the windows were free to let the gray of dawn in. Everyone expected the train to head for some munition factory in which we would be employed as forced labor. We did not know whether we were still in Poland or not. The engine's whistle had an uncanny sound, like a cry for help sent out for the commemoration of the unhappy load which, was it was, which it was destined to lead to perdition. The train shunted, obviously nearing the main station. Suddenly a cry broke from the ranks of the anxious passengers. There's a sign, Auschwitz. The very name stood for all that was horrible. Gas chambers, crematoriums, massacres, slowly, Almost hesitantly, the train moved on as if it wanted to spare its passengers the dreadful realizations as long as possible. Auschwitz. With the progressive dawn, the outlines of an immense camp became visible. Long stretches of several rows of barbed wire fences, watchtowers, searchlights, and long columns of ragged human figures, gray in the grayness of dawn trekking along the straight, desolate roads to what destination we did not know. There were isolated shouts and whistles of command. We did not know their meaning. My imagination led me to see gallows with people dangling on them. I was horrified, but this was just as well because step by step, we had to become accustomed to a horrible and immense horror. Eventually, we moved into the station. The initial silence was interrupted by shouted commands. We were to hear those rough, shrill tones and then over and over again in all the camps. Their sound was almost like the last cry of a victim. And yet, there was a difference. It had a rasping hoarseness. And if it came from the throat of a man who had kept shouting like that, a man who was being murdered again, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Their sound was almost like the last cry of a victim. And yet there was a difference. It had a rasping hoarseness, as if it came from the throat of a man who had to keep shouting like that, a man who was being murdered again and again. The carriage doors were flung open and a small detachment of prisoners stormed inside. They wore striped uniforms. Their heads were shaved, but they looked well-fed. They spoke in very possibly European tongues and all with a certain amount of humor, which sounded grotesque under the circumstances, like a drowning man clutching a straw. 
My inborn optimism, which has often controlled my feelings, even in the most desperate situations, clung to this thought. These prisoners look quite well. They seem to be in good spirits and even laugh. Who knows? I might manage to share their favorable position. In psychiatry, there's a certain condition known as delusion of reprieve. The condemned man immediately before his execution gets the illusion that he might be reprieved at the very last minute. We too clung to shreds of hope and believed to the last moment that it would not be so bad. Just the sight of the red cheeks and round faces of those prisoners was a great encouragement. Little did we know then that they formed a specially chosen elite who for years had been receiving squad for new transports as they rolled into the station day after day. They took charge of the new arrivals and their luggage, including scarce items and smuggled jewelry. Auschwitz must have been a strange spot in this Europe of the last years of war. There must have been unique treasures of gold and silver, platinum and diamonds, not only the huge storehouses, but also in the hands of the SS. 1,500 captives were cooped up in a shed built to accommodate probably 200 at the most. We were cold and hungry, and there was not enough room for everyone to squat on the bare ground, let alone to lie down. One five-ounce piece of bread was our only food for four days. Yet I heard the senior prisoners in charge of the shed bargain with one another, of the receiving party about a tie pin made of platinum and diamonds. Most of the profits would eventually be traded for liquor, schnapps. I do not remember any more just how many thousands of marks were needed to purchase the quantity of schnapps required for a gray evening. But I do know that those long-term prisoners needed schnapps. Under such conditions, who could blame them for trying to dope themselves up? There was another group of prisoners who got liquor supplied in almost unlimited quantities by the SS. These were the men who were employed in the gas chambers and crematoriums and who knew very well that one day they would be received by a new shift of men and that they would have their leave, their enforced role of executioner and become victims themselves. Nearly everyone in our transport lived under the illusion that he would be reprieved, that everything would yet be well. We did not realize the meaning behind the scene that was to follow presently. We were told to leave our luggage at the train and to fall into two lines, women on one side, men on the other. In order to file past a senior SS officer, surprisingly enough, I had the courage to hive hide my haversack under my coat. My line filed past the officer man by man. I realized that it would be dangerous if the officer spotted my bag. He would at least knock me down. I knew that from previous experience. Instinctively, I straightened on approaching the officer so that he would not notice my heavy load. When I was face to face with him, he was a tall man who looked slim and fit in his spotless uniform. What a contrast to us, who were untidy and grim after our long journey. He had assumed an attitude of careless ease, supporting his right elbow with his left hand. His right hand was lifted with the forefinger of that hand. He pointed very leisurely to the right or to the left. None of us had the slightest idea of the sinister meaning behind the little movement of a man's finger, pointing now to the right and then to the left, but far more frequently to the left. It was my turn. Somebody whispered to me that to be sent to the right would mean to work and the way to the left being for the sick and those incapable of work who would be sent to a special camp. I just waited for who would be sent to a special I just waited for things to take their course with me. The first of many such times to come. My haversack weighed me down a bit to the left, but I made an effort to walk straight. The SS man looked me over. Appeared to hesitate, then put both his hands on my shoulders. 
I tried very hard not to look smart, and he turned my shoulders very slowly until I faced right. And I moved over to that side. The significance of the finger game was explained to, to, to us this evening. It was the first selection, the first verdict made on our existence or non-existence. For the great majority of our transport, about 90% of it met death. Their sentence was carried out within the next few hours. Those who were sent to the left were marched from the station straight to the crematorium. This building, as I was told by someone who worked there, had the word bath written all over its doors in several European languages. On entering, each prisoner was handed a piece of soap. And then, but mercifully, I do not need to describe the events which followed. Many accounts have been written about this horror. We who were saved, the minority of our transport found out the truth in the evening. I inquired from the prisoners who had been there for some time where my colleague and friend P had been sent. He was sent to the left side. Yes, I replied. Then you can see him there, I was told. Where? A hand pointed to the chimney a few hundred yards off, which was sealing up a column of, of flame and gray into the sky of Poland. It dissolved into a sinister cloud of smoke. That's where your friend is, floating up to heaven, was the answer. But I still did not understand until the truth was explained to me in plain words. But I am telling these things out of their turn. From a psychological point of view, we had a long, long way in front of us from the break of that dawn to, at the station until our first night's rest at camp. Escorted by SS guards with loaded guns, we were made to run from the station past, electrically, past electrically charged barbed wire through the camp to the cleansing station for those of us who had passed the first selection. This was a real bath. Again, our illusion of reprieve found confirmation. The SS men seemed almost charming. Soon we found out their reason. They were nice to us as long as they saw watches on our wrists and could persuade us in well-meaning tones to hand them over. We would not have to hand over all of our possessions anyway. And why should we not? Relatively nice persons, okay. We would not have to hand over all our possessions anyway, and why should and why should not that relatively nice person have the watch? Maybe one day one good turn would afford another. We waited in a shed which seemed to be the anteroom of the disinfecting chamber. SS men appeared to spread out blankets into which we had to throw all of our possessions, all of our watches and jewelry. There were still naive prisoners among us who asked, to the amusement of their more seasoned ones, who were there as helpers, if they could not keep the wedding ring, a medal, or a good luck piece, please. No one could yet grasp the fact that everything would be taken away from us. I tried to take one of the old prisoners into my confidence, approaching him fervently. I pointed to a roll of paper in the inner pocket of my coat and said, look, this is the manuscript of a scientific book. I know what you'll say, that I should be grateful to escape with my life, that I should be, it should be all that I can expect of fate, but I cannot help myself. I must keep this manuscript at all costs. It contains my life's work. Do you understand? Yes, he was beginning to understand. <laughs> A grin split, spread slowly over his face. His pious, then more amused, mocking, insulting, until he bellowed one word at me in answer to my question, a word that was ever present in the vocabulary of the camp inmates. Shit! At that moment, I saw the plain truth and did what marked the culminating point of the first phase of my psychological reaction. I struck out my whole former life. Suddenly there was a stir among my fellow travelers who had been standing about with pale, frightened faces, helplessly debating for this and that. Again, we heard the hoarsely shouted commands. 
We were driven with blows into the immediately anteroom of the bath. There were the assembled around they there we assembled around the SS man who waited until we all arrived. Then he said, I will give you two minutes and I shall time you by my watch. In these two minutes, you will fully get undressed and drop everything on the floor where you are standing. You will take nothing with you except your shoes, your belt or suspenders, and possibly a truss. I am starting to count now. With unthinkable haste, people tore off their clothes. As the time grew shorter, they became increasingly nervous and pulled clumsily at their underwear, belts, and shoelaces. Then we heard the first sounds of whipping, leather straps beaten down on our naked bodies. Next, we were herded into another room to be shaved. Not only our heads were shorn, but not a hair was left on our entire bodies. Then on to the showers. We were lined up again. We hardly recognized each other, but with great relief, some people noted the real, that real water dripped from the sprays. While we were waiting for the shower, our nakedness was brought home to us. We really had nothing. Now, except our bare bodies, even minus hair, we all... Even minus hair, all we possessed literally was our naked existence. What else remained for us was a material link of our former lives. For me, there were my glasses and my belt, the latter I had to exchange later for the piece of bread. There was an extra bit of excitement in store for the owners of trusses. In the evening, the senior prisoners in charge of our hut welcomed us with a speech in which he gave us his word of honor that we would hang personally from that beam. He pointed to it. Any person who had sewn money or precious stones into his trust. Proudly, he explained that as a senior inhabitant of the camp laws, it entitled him to do so. There were sh <clears throat> Where our shoes were concerned, matters were not so simple. Although we were supposed to keep them, those who had fairly decent pairs of shoes had to give them up after all and were given in exchange shoes that did not fit them. In for real trouble were those prisoners who had followed the apparently well-meant advice given in the anteroom of the senior prisoners who had shortened their jack boots by cutting the tops off, then smearing soap on the cut edges to hide the sabotage. The SS men seemed to have waited for just that. All suspected of this crime had to go to a small adjoining room. After a time, we began to hear the lashings of the strap and the screams of the tortured men. This time it lasted for quite a while. Thus the illusion of some of us still held were okay, thus the illusions some of us still held were destroyed one by one, and then quite unexpectedly most of us were overcome by a grim sense of humor. We knew that we had nothing to lose except our ridiculously naked lives. When the shower started to run, we all tried very hard to make fun both about ourselves and about each other. After all, real water did flow from the sprays. Apart from the strange kind of humor, another sensation seized us, curiosity. I have experienced this type of curiosity before as a fundamental reaction towards certain strange circumstances when my life was once endangered by, climbing, by a climbing accident. I felt only one sensation at the critical moment curiosity. Curiosity as to whether I should come out of it alive or with a fractured skull or some injuries. Cold curiosity predominated even the, in Auschwitz, somehow detaching the mind from its surroundings, which came to be regarded with a kind of objectivity. At the time one cultivated this state of mind as a means of protection, we were anxious to know what would happen next and what would be the consequence, for example, of our standing in the open air in the chill of the late autumn, stark naked and still wet from the showers. In the next few days, our curiosities evolved into surprise, surprise that we did not catch cold. All right, I'm going to stop right there. I'll see you all tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. God willing. 
Thank you for joining me. And uh, again, we are reading Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Bye.